All right. DEF CON 22 Elevator Hacking. I am blown away that people are in here right now listening to us. We love you too. And we love that DEF CON allowed us to do this even though we were told it had to be the last talk on the last day. Because, you know, breaking things. So why are we here? What are we talking about? Why do we do this? Some of you know me. I'm Deviant. I own a pen testing firm with Bobak up there. We break into buildings. We do physical side. And many buildings leverage their elevators as part of their security model. They should not do that. Howard? My name's Howard. I'm not here representing Pain Elevator, despite the name. Don't be confused. And also, I do have an employer whose views and opinions are not the ones I will express. So please do not blame my employer for what's about to happen. Yeah. I drink bourbon, he drinks cheap beer, and we break into things. There are a lot of things that can go wrong with elevator hacking. You should be aware of this. Elevators are generally very safe, right? Elevators are regarded as the safest form of travel. Based on miles traveled, they virtually always work the way they're expected to. Most people have never been injured by an elevator. Some of you have probably been entrapped, but probably not injured. Most injuries that happen are people who are working in the mechanical spaces, such as the hoistway or the shaftway, the machine room, and the pit. Yeah. So guys like me. You can do really bad things to yourself with an elevator if you're a jack wagon. That leg was saved, though. Yeah, this leg actually survived. But most of you, our concern is not that you're dumb enough to kill yourselves, but that you're going to break shit because you think it's fun to screw around. <laughs> so yeah, elevator, you know, the helicopter, right? The escalator helicopter on YouTube. It's all fun until you cause a felony criminal mischief. Thousands of dollars in damage. Plus criminal penalties. Don't do that. In general, like you're gonna you're gonna look at elevators differently after this talk, right? You're gonna spot, spot little things in elevators. Elevators will tell you if she doesn't want to be touched, don't touch her. Leave it alone. If you don't know what something is, like do not turn key. Don't do it. We are professionals. Well, I mean, he's a professional. I'm just up here talking silly. But the things you see in this talk, we want you to learn. We don't necessarily want you to try all of it unless you have a really good scoping document that legal prepared on a pen test or something. <laughs> types of elevators? Sure. So elevators, broadly speaking, fall into two types of categories. The first being hydraulic. Those are piston driven from below, typically. The other type are traction or roped elevators. We call them ropes. They're actually steel cables. In that case, a traction elevator is usually propelled by a motor in the motor room that's above the cab and it's gaining traction on the ropes and moving the cab and the counterweight system. So elevators generally ride on two rails with guide rollers like this, like you're seeing in this slide. They're not anchored in. It's sometimes you'll see shoes instead of rollers like this. But the principle is the elevator is just guided up and down by these rails. And the hoisting, or uh, as if in the case of a hydraulic elevator, the uh, lifting mechanism is doing the work. This is just the way that it's guided smoothly. Yeah. So, just think of it as sliding up and down a track in the hoistway. So most people in this room, their interaction with elevators is limited to fixtures like you're seeing here. So on the left you see what's called a COP or a car operating panel. When you push a button on that for say floor one, two, or three, you're doing what's registering a cab call because you're telling the elevator exactly where you want to go. That's as opposed to when you're in the hallway, you press the up or down button, you're registering a directional demand, but you're not actually telling the elevator where it's going to go. That's called a hall call. And of course, there's position indicators and direction indicators that keep you from being a jack wagon and getting on an up elevator when you're going down. Please don't do that. Yeah. But again, all the power is coming from a motor room, either above or below. It's not in the elevator itself. Right. So what you're seeing here are gearless traction machines, very high speed machines. I believe these were DC power. They are usually used in higher rise buildings to achieve the speed that's necessary to travel effectively inside a high rise. On the other end of the spectrum, you'll see motor rooms that look like this. This is a hydraulic elevator. And as you can see, it's a very simple system. There's a programmable controller that's on the right side. And there's a hydraulic pump that's connected to that piping, which goes to the plunger, which lifts the elevator. You're never going to see hydros taller than what, usually? The highest I've ever seen was eight stories. Was that roped or unroped? No, it was, an, it was actually a Dover hydraulic, H-I-G-H. Right they on. Call it. Yeah. 
So he mentioned the controller on the wall. I mean, this is what the elevator makes all its decisions on. This is the brain of the entire unit. So what you're going to learn throughout this talk is that elevators have a variety of sensors that provide inputs such as things about its current velocity, its current position, whether the doors are open or closed, a myriad of things. Those inputs all feed back to the controller and then the controller makes decisions like should I be driving the motor door? Uh, should I be driving the door motor? Excuse me. Should I be driving the hoist motor up or down? We know we're talking really fast and those who've seen us before, you know we're better speakers than this, but we want to get to all the good shit. So we hope you uh, don't mind that we're chattering through. I mean, if you're really like Aspie Aspie train spotter folk and you want to learn all this stuff, like download the slides later. But we want to show you like keys and stuff. So one of the most primitive forms of inputs is called a limit switch. And the limit switches generally exist at the top and the bottom of the hoistway. And they're there to indicate to the controller when the elevator is reaching the end of its run. So in this case, you see there are three roller switches and a fourth one that's mounted above that. The two that are on the bottom are called the slowdowns. As the elevator is approaching its top floor, it will trip the first slowdown and the second slowdown, which increasingly decreases the speed of the motor until it hits that third one, which is called the normal limit. When the elevator's on its normal limit, it's level with the top floor or the bottom floor as the case may be. So now you're probably wondering why is there What's a fourth the last one? one for? That's to basically indicate when the elevator is about to run off the rails. There's literally nowhere else for it to go. It's the final limit. Yeah, if the elevator hits that, it's not an easy fix. You don't just turn it off and on again. Although we saw people trying to do that in a mall. Yes, we did. So there are other types of inputs like velocity detection. This is a device that's called a motor encoder. As the drive shaft of the motor spins, it also spins the indicator on the motor, control, uh, the motor encoder which allows the controller to determine how many revolutions it's made in a certain amount of time. It will then be able to determine how fast the elevator should be traveling. It'll then match it up with other types of position information, such as the position indicator. So the elevator in the hoistway is either magnetically or through other means actually telling where it is in the hoistway. It's a really funny freak out that can happen. If an elevator gets lost, it will essentially make a full travel of the hoistway to relearn where, where it went wrong. So if you've ever been in an elevator that suddenly like didn't go where you were going, went all the way up, went all the way down, went all the way, and it was like, okay, I'm fine again. What it was doing, it was not, it didn't match up with what the controller thought. So all these inputs come together and if the inputs don't match, if the elevator panics, it'll like hit the brakes, it'll do all kinds of things. Right. So there are driving machine brakes which are sort of the normal brakes that when the elevator is at rest, the brakes will be applied. When the elevator is moving, the brakes will be dropped. So there are other types of brakes. The safeties. People have probably heard that an elevator can't free fall and that's generally true. Devices like this on the left, it's a, something called a governor. And it's a centrifugal device that as the elevator speeds up, that flywheel will spin faster and faster and eventually jaws on it will fly out, trip and grab the governor rope, which we'll get to in a second. That will stop the car. The device that you're seeing on the right is a newer form of safety. It's called a rope gripper and prevents unexpected upward movement. So people are kind of afraid that the elevator is going to free fall. You should be afraid it's going to fall up because the counterweight weighs more than the cab. Did anybody see that video a little while ago that made the rounds, right? The, the guy, the elevator's going up, 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 up and didn't stop and it crashed into the overhead. Yes. I believe it was from Chile. Yeah. Yeah. This would have stopped that. So in general though, like what we just wanted to start you out with was understanding that these mechanisms are easy to really just figure out. You can see how they work and you can see that they're really safe. This is a demo of one of the original like rail gripper safety mechanisms. This is what made Elijah Graves Otis famous. This is the idea of if the ropes are cut, the elevator won't plummet into free fall. And this, as you're seeing now, not on an American show, this is like British TV because he's being hoisted very, very high and then just cutting the rope. This man doesn't fall. The cab is fine. Yeah. Yeah, and that was a demo that Elijah Otis would do at like world fairs because until he came along, elevators were unsafe. But nowadays they're very, very safe. Yeah, the elevators, the principle behind an elevator existed for the last 2,000 years. It's just that they were, they did, there was no way to ensure they would be safe. So that's what Otis invented, the, the safety. Your modern system, what you saw earlier with the governor and such, there are separate ropes, as we would call them. They're, they're cables, they're metal cables now usually. There are separate roping systems traveling with the car at all times. And if that governor jams and grabs, they'll actually pull up on braking gripper levers or you know clamp levers. There, there's all different types of brake shoes, but they exist just to keep you from dying. And elevators do that really well. 
If all else fails, the pit has buffers in it too. Like if the elevator is going down and the brakes don't work, if you're sliding through the brakes, the pit will have spring or oil piston buffers designed to absorb the full weight of the car at full travel speed. And you probably won't die. You might be very seriously injured, but at least you won't die. Yeah, you'll be back next year. You'll have one of those like rascals at DEF CON. So yeah, elevators do their job really well on automatic mode if you're riding in the elevator. If you're not, this is, this is where elevators get unsafe. When you're riding like a dirt face on the car. This is it. It's good fun. It's good fun. This is actual documentary footage, by the way. Come on. Yeah, turn that light on. Turn that light on. That's it. Hey. I mean, people have done this. People used to call it elevator surfing. Don't. Yeah, don't be that guy, right? Sadly, though, that is a way that elevator mechanics have been fatally injured in the past. So we're not just kidding. Please don't do this. Yeah. But if you're in the car on automatic operation, the elevator is going to keep you very safe. Would you like to learn about non-automatic operation? Yeah. All right. The most common thing that I use as a pen tester and we have done on jobs is flip an elevator out of group service and into independent service. When you register a hall call and you have a bank of elevators, they don't like all come to your floor, right? The controller chooses one and it dispatches that to you because the elevators are all in group operation. And then if you take that elevator up, the controller knows, okay, I can't use that elevator for a while, I'll respond with this one. An elevator in independent service, as we see an independent key switch here, sometimes they are just flip toggle switches hidden behind other panels. There's a lot of little hidden panels in elevators. If you flip to independent service mode, the elevator becomes yours. It ignores all the hall calls. It ignores anything else that's not what you're telling it right there at the, at the car operating panel. That even includes opening the doors. If you drive to another floor on independent service mode, you have to manually say, like, open door or close door. I have hidden in, like, target buildings for hours in an elevator just on independent service because it's not going anywhere. People could call the elevators all day and, you know, no one ever notices, like, hey, how come elevator passenger seven hasn't been responding all day? Like, no, you just you get on the first one you come to. If I'm in independent service, like I wheeled an office chair in, in an elevator once and just sat there waiting until everyone went home and then I let Bobak in and we like rocked house all over a data center. <laughs> so yeah, independent service is really useful if you're a pen tester because it takes the elevator completely out of the group and gives it just to you. It becomes your elevator. So there's a, a similar mode to independent called attendant service and it has its roots in the history of the elevator industry when there actually was an attendant who would drive the cab up or down using a hand crank like you're seeing here. So on a more modern system that had automatic leveling and control, you'd see something like this behind a lock panel. There are up and down controls to allow the attendant to signal that it wants to reverse direction. So they might have a cab full of people or a VIP or something and they decide, let's stop collecting all the calls in this direction and get these people wherever they need to go. And then that bypass button, sometimes it's called the non-stop button or you'll even see NS sometimes, that allows the attendant to continue in the same direction with a full car and skip all the hall calls. When he's done, delivering those people to wherever their destination is, all of those hall calls are still registered. So eventually, it'll pick up those passengers who are still waiting in the hallway. It was just a way for the attendant to signal that the cab was full or, yeah. or whatever. It's like the closed door hack, which doesn't fucking work, so everyone should stop repeating that all the time. Except yeah. that there's that one kind uh, of way yeah. that it works. Ask us about, like, yeah, ask us about relay logic controllers and how, yeah. We actually think the origin of that was independent. They saw, somebody saw an elevator on independent or attendant where, where the operator was holding door close to like, because you have to on independent mode. And then someone's like, oh wow, did you see what that guy did? I'll do that later. No, you won't, motherfucker, unless you have the key switch. What if you want to have a high priority service but you don't want to hire someone to stand in the elevator all day? 
So there are two types of priority services that I'm familiar with. One is called express priority mode. The other one's called executive priority mode. So we mentioned a moment ago that elevators will tend to pick up calls and demand that are in the same direction as it's already traveling, right? So if there's passengers going, on, going up, they're going to collect every single up call on the way up as it's going. And when it reaches the end, it'll reverse direction. In this case, an authorized user might have a key or a badge that allows them to signal to the elevator controller that they're more important than regular people. <laughs> so the difference between those two modes, by the way, is one will actually reverse the direction that the cab is traveling in to serve that person as fast as possible. Yeah. And what happens when the VIP is being served? Yep. Uh, in particular, it's funny if you ever see this used on an elevator that has the voice announced, you know, it'll say going up, going down, and if an executive puts their key in, it'll say, this elevator is needed for other reasons. Please exit immediately when the door is open. Yeah, it kicks you out of the fucking elevator. It's great. <laughs> Maybe if you're the type of person who has seen interesting religious communities and their beliefs and, and other things like that, you may be familiar with Sabbath mode. Has anyone ever seen an elevator that has Sabbath mode? Right on. Or you saw a movie with Bill Maher, like Religious, where they talk about it. Sabbath mode is for people who believe that on certain days they're not allowed to interact with certain mechanical systems, switches and toggles. Sabbath mode lets people get around a building by driving all the way to the top floor without any input at all, and then platforming automatically at every single floor on the way down. So, you know, it's like, I like, it's kind of like hacking God, I guess, if you're like, ha, ah, I found a loophole in scripture, so I'm smarter than you. But yeah, that's, that's Sabbath service, and a lot of elevators, especially in certain larger cities, uh, like you're from the New York area, there's a lot of Sabbath mode up there. Very common. Ask us later about why it doesn't exactly do what some people think it does, and maybe some religious scholars need to double check their notes. Load bypass, holy shit. This is something that should be enabled more often and isn't. Elevators know how heavy they are. Like, you've put too much shit in an elevator once, the elevator beeped at you and got angry, right? They have weight sensors. They can use that data to say, hmm, I'm collecting all these calls and I'm pretty full. I should not fucking stop at a bunch of other floors right now because it's going to be a bunch of this. Sorry, no room. Sorry, no room for like five more floors. Yeah, hope if you come to like, the, you know, freaking hope in New York. Why this isn't enabled more often is beyond me. Why anti-nuisance is not enabled. If you're a freaking derpy derp and you like to press all the buttons, do you know elevators can actually no, sorry, junk that out? Three. Hit more calls. I keep going. All right, well, awesome. There it goes. Boom, done. <laughs> That's amazing. Keep recording. Very good. So we're going down. One, two, three, and boom, out. It's, got, it's, like, yeah, like it's like they know we're here. Yeah, it's like that. yeah so that's called anti nuisance mode. And there's peak programming if you're a building where like workers come in in the morning or ever, all the guests at a hotel check out at a certain hour. There's all kind of optimization that you can do, and that's something that a competent elevator consultant can do for you. There's also, if you want to like, you know, have extra special considerations of when people shouldn't be coming and going, right? Yeah, so I saw a mode at a museum once, and it was called riot mode. So I was like, what the heck is this? Apparently, they, the building owners wanted a way that if there was civil unrest, they could lock the ground floor out of their elevator system, but still use it for, to access the other floors. So again, somebody in the security room would hit a button, say, oh gosh, there's a riot happening outside. Mm -hmm. And when it does that, it's- Occupy Tulsa. <laughs> So it would just stop responding to the ground floor because if somebody was able to get in at the ground level, they might, you know, inadvertently get on an elevator and do bad things. So yeah. But the greatest part of riot mode is that the elevators keep working in the rest of the building. So you can be like looking out your high-rise apartment being like, oh, why can't the 99% just be happy with what scraps we give them? And like, you'll keep going around your, your floors, you don't care, you just can't go to the lobby. So also, besides civic unrest, there's also seismic unrest. So you might live in a seismically stable region, and you may never have seen this, or you might live in Southern California, where there's a little jewel on the elevator sometimes that says seismic. And of course, people love to make this joke. It's going to cause an earthquake when you push it, man. No. It's an indicator to let you know that if an earthquake is occurring, you should exit the cab as soon as possible. So a lot of times, it's very simple mechanical systems. It might just be a ring on a string, they call it, where there's a metal cable running up and down the hoistway. And if the cab starts swinging side to side, that ring might come in contact with the string, completing a circuit, indicating to the controller that 
unexpected lateral movement is occurring. And it's the one kind of emergency mode that might actually take you up. Yep. So it's a little counterintuitive, but if you think about it, what can happen, one of the risks during an earthquake is that if the cab or the counterweight actually becomes displaced from the rails that are supposed to be guiding it, now you've just got a 2,500, you know, 3,000 pound yeah, counterweight ball swinging in around. The, in the hoistway with you. Yeah, so it moves you away from the counterweight, even if that means moving you in the up direction. How many people maybe work in a hospital or medical facility? You may have seen code blue service. Right on. That's medical priority. Imagine the highest VIP priority, where a doctor or an emergency personnel will use a, a key and they will seize an elevator. Well, the closest one will respond, and then it becomes their elevator until they key back out. That's called code blue. Hospitals often also have code pink. If you're curious what that is, it's baby theft mode. If the little baby lojack gets set off because somebody moves a baby unauthorized, the elevators can basically turn into security recall devices, which is its own mode that you can program independent of a hospital. It turns the elevator into a man trap. It'll deliver the person to a floor of your designation and like keep the doors shut until you come up there, or it'll cycle the doors manually so that they can't hide in the elevator. There's all kind of fascinating things you can do with elevator security, and there's other things people try to do, and we're going to shit all over that in a minute. There's also just modes that you'll see if you're looking, if you start getting into this, you'll see security service. This is kind of a catch-all key switch. It doesn't always mean what you think. Like all the key switches in this photo are actually the same keyway. And I look, you look at one of them, the, the security service looks beat to hell. So I asked the desk at this hotel, I'm like, hey, you know, I work with elevators, I'm just curious, are you having security incidents like every freaking day? And he's like, no, the maids use that to go to the basement. So, you know, just because you see something, it doesn't actually do what you think it does. One of the most misunderstood modes is firefighters' emergency operation. You're seeing here two key switches that are instrumental in the, in the use of an elevator during a fire. When a heat or smoke condition is detected by the building's fire alarm system, there are contacts that connect the fire alarm control panel to the elevator controller, which indicates that there is such a condition and that it's no longer safe to run the elevators. You've probably seen signs, they're supposed to be at every landing, and it says, do not use the elevator in the event of a fire. You shouldn't be able to. The elevator should go away from you and sit in the lobby. It should, but the thing is, the smokes and heats that are tied into the elevator are That's usually only at the yeah. landing. So the building can be on fire down there, and the elevator over there is still working. So. But if the elevator has platformed in the lobby, a firefighter can take control of it in what's called fire phase two, and then they can drive it around the building in a very, very powerful way. We'll show you some of that. Sure. I don't think we defined it, but just to be clear, phase one is when the smoke and heat detectors go off. It brings the elevators down to the lobby or some other designated landing floor. The firefighters can manually put the car on phase one if they're not there already, but once the car is on phase one, then they can go in and use their key to activate phase two, which allows them to run the car during the fire situation, overriding the fact that it's otherwise locked out. Overriding pretty much everything. Everything? Because, yeah. You think independent mode is powerful? Firefighter's phase is way more powerful. There's a card reader? Fuck you. This floor's locked out? Fuck you. I'm a firefighter. I gotta get there. By code, it has to be disabling any security systems so, yeah. that, so, so that the firefighters can get to the floor they need to go to. So there's one more mode that's even more powerful than this. Like, in the elevator world, who could ever be more important than a firefighter? Us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, elevator guys, right? So hoistway inspection, if you, can, if you can take command of the elevator and get into the hoistway, which is super fucking dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, don't goddamn do this. If you do know what you're doing, there's all kind of controls in there that you should uh, you know, not have to do anything, do anything with because you don't know what they are. Exactly. Yeah, but oh my god, yeah, you'll see something about that later maybe. So plenty of buildings try to use elevators as part of their security model. Maybe you've seen a building where you can't register a hall call, where you have to use a key, right? Or the, the hall buttons are disabled. Maybe there's no hall buttons. There's only a key switch, right? Maybe you've been in situations where a badge reader is used or a hotel key card is used. So not being able to make the elevator come to you and you can drive it later. We'll show you an interesting little trick about that in a minute. Maybe you've been in situations where you can get in the elevator, but certain floors are locked out. These are called cutout switches. What kind of locks are these, anybody who's been in the lockpick village? 
Yeah, wave for locks or shit ones. Those are valid answers, right? So all the elevator key switches we have up here, almost all of them are wafer locks. Some are a little harder than you think, but you can pick them later if you want. This is not a wafer lock. What kind of lock is this? That is a medical lock. I'm very interested in what's on floor seven in that building. But it, anything like you know lockouts or badge systems, these are common ways that people try to treat the elevator as restricting your movement. They try to say, oh, you know, someone couldn't get to floor seven or floor 20 or floor whatever unless they have the right credential. Fuck a bunch of that. <laughs> That's not how you should think about your elevators. Do you want to secure an elevator? This is what you're doing. What kind of lock? What's, what's going on here? Yeah. Sure. So we had a job one time in a facility that was trying to secure itself, and we came across this. And I said, well, gee, that's a very interesting way to secure the hallway here. What yeah. have they done? What is this key? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. let's, just, let's just show them. Yeah. Yeah, it was a jail. Yeah. It's a giant cage in front of the elevator. <laughs> Unless you're doing this, think of your elevators like a stairway. Just think of them as a stairway where lazy people don't use their legs. Think of your security in that way because everything we just showed you, we'll just shit all over it. So remember when there's like no hall call buttons? You can't get the elevator to show up? Oh, I use my magic hacksaw paper. Well, what happened there? Well, the elevator happened to be at the floor, so somebody tripped the safety edge. And it's a really smart idea to stick things through the hoistway doors if you don't know what's back no, there, right? No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, just to be clear, that's not a universal trick. In fact, actually, that's kind of unusual that it did work. The, those sensors should have been disabled when the doors were closed, but this kid at some high school somewhere on YouTube imagined to, imagined, uh, yeah. happened to find out that it worked. So. But most of what we do, when most of what we're going to talk to you about is overriding systems just by using the key switches. There's key switches inside of all, how many people have seen little panels in elevators that you pop open and there's all kind of stuff in there that's interesting, right? Some of those panels are locked. None of you would ever have picked those locks, right? Interesting point, and Howard's going to slap me, um, there's something in the industry called a slam panel, which is a little click shut. It's like a spring-loaded latch. The reason it's called a slam panel is because you can just kind of, and it'll pop open. <laughs> yeah, but inside of the panels, you'll see things like, look, independent service that we told you about, hoistway service, you shouldn't touch it, card reader disable, like, oops, I don't have my key, let me just turn off that function. The industry is so awash in different key switches and different keys that you'll start to see, like, in the industry, they call it graffiti in the motor rooms and in the car panels. You'll see notes from elevator guys and gals, like, oh, this key is needed for this, this key is needed for this. You'll start to think that keys are really different all over the place. And yes, there's a lot of keys. If you're on a pen test job, you might try to look for the elevator keys, like, sometimes you just find them. <laughs> But if you're on a legit elevator job, what this man has done for years now is catalog every key he's ever seen on every job. Ever. Ever. As far as I know, Howard's the only one that has a collection of every elevator key he's ever found, and he knows what it does. This is not Howard's key collection, by the way. This is Howard's key collection. <laughs> You might notice, it's, this is actually an old photo. Yeah. This is what, you know, every elevator, there's all different brands, there's all, you, you, all different fixtures, and you can just spot them. Right. So when you have the experience to look at something and say, ah, I've seen that on another job, I know who manufactured that, or I've just, you know, seen the catalog, I've seen this company's flyers, I've visited their trade shows and seen their fixture displays, it's all the same. They use the same things everywhere. And that is one of the main points to take away from this. If they sold you a key switch, the buttons look alike and the key switches look alike too. They don't just look alike, they're key to like. Yeah. So you start to recognize, hey, you know, my elevator uses Adam's fixtures. Guess what? Your key probably operates the other guy's elevator with Adam's fixtures too. Yeah, and there's all different resellers. There's, so there's secondary branding, there's modernizing that happens. Like this facility right here, we're in the Rio, right? Dover Impulse. How many people have seen those buttons a billion times? And when I started to try to learn this, and I, you know, I'm on jobs, and I'll, like, I'll send a cell phone photo to him, I'm like, holy shit, I'm pretty sure I have the key for this, right? What is it? He's like, you know what it is. I'm like, I don't know what it is. They all look the goddamn same. He's like, no, look at the, how thick is the halo around it. What font is the... They all look like you know, the same to you until you start learning it. And you can, type the, you can type the fixtures just by glancing at them, and you know what keys you need. 
That's totally Helvetica on the left. Yeah, EPCO, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, EPCO. Exactly. And the other is... Innovation. Innovation. I, I well, it says like it on the slide, like, so I should like know a, that. It's like an aerial narrow, I think. <laughs> so, yeah. I could do this to him all day. Now, if you want your own elevator keys, like, people, you know, sell them online. Many people probably shouldn't be. And you probably shouldn't buy them because they're ripping you off. Like, this key set, it's like almost $9 a key. Yep. And it actually has to ship UPS ground because the smoke in the picture is included. <laughs> So it's it's I, I don't even know what half these things are to tell you the truth. They like took it's like maybe like a elevator guy retired like 20 years ago. They took his key ring and just copied every single one because the fixtures these are used for are like completely dead and long gone, except in the most rare cases. Yeah. This is the mo one of the more popular ones that you can find online. It costs almost twelve dollars a key, and you get at least 17 of them in the set. And don't get me wrong, though. The, the, the vendor did two very nice things for us. They took very clear, straight on photos of the keys. <laughs> with the labels visible. Yeah. And they really took care to make sure this was going to be comprehensive. This is really perfect for your fire department as long as your fire department simultaneously serve, serves the state of Massachusetts, New Jersey, New Hampshire, New York, South Carolina, and Arizona. Yeah, so if that's what your trucks are rolling through, like that's your job, rock out. Found the key set for you, only two hundo. Yeah, what, what probably happened, of course, was the vendor had a contact in the elevator industry and someone kept handing them keys and saying, I've seen this work, or this is a fire key. And they went, well, we better put it on our set. Right. So when you buy keys online, when you buy keys from shitty sources, you don't know what you're getting exactly. You might be getting a key that was speed run on a duplicator that kind of has the right biddings but doesn't versus a code cut original factory key. It's the difference between like going on eBay and going on elevatorkeys.com. Is anyone going to sell them like to this room? How many people are going to try to call Elevator Keys probably now? This freaking guy gets all the calls now. Yeah, don't bother. Read the verification requirements. They will not sell it to you unless you are a legitimate emergency or elevator personnel. That guy's a dick. I've tried on the phone a lot. <laughs> but in general, this is an industry way behind the times on security. So, like, what kind of key switch is this on floor two? What kind is it? You've been in the village. Tubular. tubular lock. What did the guy tell you when you talked? <laughs> this, is, this is a true story, I swear. It was a casino. And the building's architect was present at a meeting, and he happened to mention that he had a personal investment in selecting the key switches on the elevator. And he made a comment to the effect of, no one would ever be able to pick that. That's a tubular lock. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's an industry where, like, someone says, oh, Medico is a great brand. We'll get tons and tons of Medico key switches. I asked Howard to like, I was like, let me see all those keys. And I started pushing them around on a table. And then I grabbed Bobbix's like little wee bit and I lined them all up. Yeah, it's a mastered system where half the biddings aren't even mastered and the rest is such a huge sample size that I was able to determine the master bidding. I had Howard once send me a picture and I was like, hell, look at that, a Dover system. He's like, yeah, it's a Dover key, but look where I found it. Like, <laughs> There's all kind of reuse in the industry because you think your keys are unique and it's just a, a supplier calling a supplier calling a warehouse who's shipping them thousands of the same cylinder. Stock locks. This is people yeah. are buying stock locks. It's all whatever's stock cheap. Gear. You also have industries where they try to start enabling shit online because that's what everything has to be on the internet now. So like MCE, you know, MCE is like, oh, our, you know, we have this box that you're going to see later. Yeah, it's hooked up. You put it on your network and make sure we can fix it if it goes wrong. Like change your, like add an account called MCE support and make the user's password MCE support. Go ahead and just change your admin password to MCE support. Just make it all the same password everywhere because we need to get in. This is the MCE system that they need to get into remotely. This is supposed to be forward facing from your network. This is, you know, up in your elevator's motor room. This is attached to the controller so you can do all kind of remote management. Is this the kind of thing you think is smart to be publicly facing with a user and a password on the, on the router of your building called MCE support where you can access these features remotely? Raise your hand if that's a good idea. Well, I mean, in this room, a lot of hands are going up because we want that to be a good idea. But like, yeah. No, yeah. But, but it's no. cool. They paid for extended support for XP. Yeah. <laughs> There's also things like Otis Elite Service. We just kind of love this promo video. As your building's requirements change, you can customize your elevator's operation to fit your specific needs with a simple telephone call to our elite engineers. Elite. I wanted to elite. observe one of our elevators. It won't be a problem. 
I'm going to take elevator number two from the bank and I'll reserve it for your move. You can so like you don't have the independent key switch? You just call the company up and be like, no, I'm totally Bob Jones. This is my building. I re it's on star for elevators. Like you just kind of bluff your way through it. And I'm sure you could get the elevator to do things because they're doing it remotely. It's all remote management. You have like this in the industry. The fire keys we showed you, there's so many different ones that at one point they tried to push for a uniform fire key. Does anybody know what FEOK1 is? Show of hands. All right. Yeah. So FEOK1 was the key that was adopted in the 2007 edition of the ASME A171 safety code for elevators and escalators. They wanted to eliminate firefighters having to carry around key sets that were overpriced and weighed a pound. And they, def they said, let's just make one standard key. And only you can have it. Yeah, yep. Right. Only elevator and emergency personnel are supposed to possess this. So of course. <laughs> so let's just publish the bidding. Yeah. Let's put that in the code right there because that's smart. <laughs> this is the kind of thing you see in the industry though. It's an industry that hasn't had anyone with security background really pushing on any of these topics. Not to mention it's all circuits at the end of the day. Like it's all naked on the inside. If you pop open the panels or if the panels just aren't secured, why are you messing with key switches? You could just bridge the contacts. Okay, so the reason why we're here, so, of course, is you'll see me open. This is kind of funky, but look at this. This entire swing panel just opens up. It's insane. It's not secured at all. Oh my. Uh oh. This is not secured either. What's happening? I'm not a fucking new speaker. I'm not a new speaker. Oh, yeah. a new speed. This is his first Shh. time on a stage at Def Be very, very quiet. We're hunting noobs. Uh-oh. Are you uh, oh, taking? Uh, I utilize. Are you a new speaker? <laughs> <laughs> how, many are, how many glasses are you putting out here? Oh, my God. Oh, oh I awesome. thank you. Oh, cool. Thanks, man. This is the last one. Oh, my God. You'll never see us again. Who was here at the uh, handcuff talk when the goons raided the stage with like ninja swords and piracy and then I think we handcuffed decode to a railing and Ray had to get him out. Yeah, Ray had to get him out of the cuffs, man. See this, this is why people love to bitch that like, oh, DEF CON's changing, like DEF CON's Black Hat now and Black Hat's RSA. Fuck a bunch of that. This doesn't happen at Black Hat. <laughs> to our new speakers. <laughs> Thank you, fellas. This is the final uh, edition of Shot the Noob for this year. So I'd like to thank my Shot the Noob colleagues. You guys like this? Should we do it again next year? You were. We didn't, right on. We didn't throw your timing off or anything, did we? There's no talk after us. We'll just keep talking and answering questions all night if people want. Like, okay. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you want to see, you know, fun, crazy. Well, no, no, the, the award ceremonies are happening right now, where other people are speaking for us. So yeah, like, we'll hang out until hotel throws us out of here. If you have crazy elevator questions. <laughs> Badge systems, all kind of the key cards, right? People use those in a lot of buildings. There's a lot of attacks about key cards. That could be its own entire talk. Cloning credentials or what the card reader actually is looking for or not looking for. Fortunately, it's already been another talk. Major Malfunction did some of the best MagStripe research and years ago he presented it at DEF CON, ShmooCon and elsewhere. Look at MagStripe Madness as a talk if you want to get into MagStripe cloning. Look at a lot of his prox card stuff if you want to get into that kind of credential cloning. Or be like us, turn off the fucking card reader or use like independent mode. And in general, that's what pen testers do. People ask us all the time, they're like, so if you're going to break into a building and you want to leverage the elevators, what are you doing? We're optimizing his giant key ring and just using it for pen testing. So, I mean, his key ring's cool, but I sat around with Howard and I actually just took all of his key. I was like, here's your giant database and here's your list. I was like, okay screw lights and fans and like I'm not throwing a party in the elevator. I don't need to turn off the lights or make out with someone. But like, I'm like, all right, give me independent service and floor cutouts. And then we spread all those keys out. And I said, all right, group these into how common they are. So we have collections of keys that are like, this is 70% of America. 
This is the other like 20%. This you'll basically never see. This I wouldn't even buy, but I'm crazy, so I did. So yeah, we've, we've grouped these up, and if you are in the industry, maybe you speak to us later if you want some independent service keys and shit like that. Maybe you want some fire keys. You can fuck right off because legal told us we cannot give you those unless we have a special training or something, which maybe we'll write one day. But if you, <laughs> yeah, I promise we're going to do that at some point. But like here, you want an example? Like because we had to show, a, this is my favorite client story ever regarding use of key switches. There was a building and this building, everyone went in through the front and at the front there was, you know, the guard desk and they had to show credentials and they had to badge in and blah, 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 blah. There was an elevator system, and the elevator actually serviced the back entrance, which they thought of only as an exit. They said, okay, this, this door, you'd need a badge or something to get in, but no one really, everyone just used it to park their car out back. And this elevator, if, even if you were in that lobby, that rear lobby, the elevator wouldn't go anywhere because you needed a badge to get it. You know, if you didn't have a badge, they said there's no reason to have a guard back here. No one could take this elevator somewhere else. Well, if you seize control of this elevator and drive it somewhere they didn't expect you to and then pop out on another floor, the culture of this office environment was such that no one questioned us once we were in. And when we showed what you're about to see to the building owner, you'll love their reaction. They just, it blew their mind. So here we are on the parking deck. I'm, you know, he's carrying a camera and then we got the security footage. So the door is locked, right? I mean, it's like not locked very well. But now this elevator, <laughs> thank you, this elevator, we could call it, but we couldn't do anything with it unless we had our keys. Right. On, on, phase on. one, phase two. Yeah, now we did that a little fast. The elevator controller actually got a little mad at the order in which we did that. It got very mad. We broke the elevator. Yeah, we had to fuss with it for a while to get it working again. But you know, like we got upstairs, <laughs> so there's that. And then there you are. You're upstairs. You're outside. And when we show, we show this footage because the client was like, "Holy crap! How'd you get in?" You know, we train our people in social engineering, and we're like, "I socialed your elevator, bro." <laughs> like, and his like their response, literally, they were like, "That can't happen. We were told that elevator can't go up." <laughs> and we're like, what did you just say? It's an elevator. It has one job. <laughs> Elevators go up. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you, if you have key, if you can take over the key switches, this is why it was such a big to-do in New York when this gentleman on eBay was selling old, like the, most of these keys are old and busted anyway, but this guy was selling keys and the New York Post wanted to make a sky is falling story out of it and the poor dude is standing on his porch getting camera shoved in his face. But they're like, oh my God, you're selling keys to the terrorists because they are powerful. And then they print a fucking article showing the keys. And they're like, no, we were told you can't copy those keys. Yo, could, what could you do with these keys, if you, right? <laughs> yeah, Yos like he all can copy things. all of those exactly. So, but the you know in general, yeah, these are like shitty, bullshit, bad versions of the photos. Here's a really nice photo of that key, and you'll learn why it was not a security breach. That this is the New York City key. This is like the key that got all the kerfuffle. It's called the 2642 key. It's a Yale. It's an unrestricted blank. Do you know why it's called that? The bidding code is fucking 2642. <laughs> And it's not really, because the first position isn't used. <laughs> so yeah, like, Yo saw this and he filed it in like an obvious blank and we were able to, you know, do that in New York and things. Now that's just one city. It's not like, you know, an entire three-state region would use another key. That's also an unrestricted blank. And that also has a really easy code to decode. We're just gonna drop a lot of freaking keys on you right now. So if we're gonna get like, you know, renditioned, we're gonna get through these slides fast. Yep. <laughs> What's this key? All right, I, I'm gonna take this slide because there's an amazing story behind this. I was buying keys to make my key ring as complete as possible. And I came across something very unusual. I was purchasing sometimes the locks with the key because I found that was a little easier to do. Sometimes people would ask questions a little bit less. Ordering one key in general is a little bit sketchy because no building owner ever really does that. So I was sometimes just buying the lock with the key. So in one case, I bought a lock box, like we we're seeing right here, one of these little red 
block boxes like you'd see in a lobby. And the key switch, uh, the key, uh, the cylinder on the front was operated by this exact key that you're seeing here. Now I ordered another one, and it was the state of Tennessee key. Uh, it was keyed to the state of Tennessee. They simply didn't come with a key. And I looked at it, I said, well, you know, it's just a flat steel key. It, I wonder if this would, and it's open, right? Yeah. So how old is this key in the industry? Oh, it's over, probably like 100 years old. This is made by a company called Gamewell that made like those fire boxes that you'd pull on the street before everybody had telephones. And the firefighters would come and reset those boxes with a key just like this. So I guess they, somebody somewhere figured, you know, let's just reuse that key. But wait, but here's the story. Yeah. So I called up the company that sold me the key box. And I said, well, wait a minute. You sold me one key box with the key. You sold me the other one without the key. And they go, yeah, but that's because you asked for the Tennessee box. Yeah, they couldn't sell him. They're like, if you call up and you're like, I need the Tennessee key, they're like, sorry, you're not authorized. If you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I had something crazy in my ear. I need the Gamewell Christmas tree key. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> How about if you live in Indiana? Show of hands, Indiana. Anybody? Anybody? Right on. You have good gun laws. I like your state. You don't have good fire service keys, though, because they're a tubular key. It's completely unrestricted. We couldn't buy the key. We could pick the lockbox. It's sitting up here. After we picked it, we measured the bidding. We used a little hurdy-gurdy, chop, chop, chop. We made a key. There's the bidding of that. It's open. Boom. There's your freaking Indiana key. Now, some states aren't using, you know, systems that are quite so unrestricted. So like Kentucky, how many people go to DerbyCon? Oh, I should see more hands. DerbyCon's a great fucking event. Big hand for DerbyCon. <laughs> Kentucky, their key boxes, they use a Medico key. It's a classic. It's not the biaxial, but it's a Medico cam lock. You can buy that. You can't buy the key. You can just buy the cam lock. What can you do if you have the box? Because it ships open because you have to mount it when you buy it. Well, if you take the tailpiece off of a Medico cam lock, the front just slides right out. What happens then? You just peel off this top plate and you have a little extra one with you if you're doing it nefariously. There's Babak here, he's helping me get this thing apart because we said, all right, I'm pretty sure, no, wait, is it really, holy crap, it's that easy. There's the pins, there's the springs, let's put them on a Medico tray, let's do some measurements, let's compare that with what we know from our code books. All right, let's put it back together in about under five minutes. You put a new brass plate on the top, you're supposed to stamp that down with a stamp tool. The locksmith that we borrowed his from, we forgot that it was a key and knob cylinder tool. We couldn't use that. We had to stamp it down with this. We just pounded on it with an abloy for a while, but it completely is fine. Put it back together, and in the end, boom, there's your freaking Kentucky key. There's your biddings. There's your sidebar. But wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. Florida. Florida actually divides their state into seven zones. Yes, you can't buy the keys, but you can buy the locks. They're Medico M3s. Biaxial, a little bit more interesting, a little bit harder to take apart. Not that hard, and if you have a pinning tray, which this is actually a proper pin, it's not a cam lock tray, but it's useful for the left, right, center, you can completely check your code books. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's the zone four key if you live in Tampa. What's this? It's the zone kick six key. What's this? Oh, it's zone seven. Like. You want all of Florida? Boom. There you go. You got to have seven keys instead of one. Oh, and also we bought the key for Louisiana and decoded it. Oh, and also we bought the key for Virginia and decoded it. Oh, and you can also buy South Carolina, Connecticut, Arizona. We could do this all fucking day, and we have all the goddamn state keys in all these states right now. So we're not saying that these are bad locks, right? Like, we're not Mark Tobiasing you up here. We're not saying Medico is the worst cylinder ever, and you know, you should use like, get a Fiche F3D, because if you try to take it apart, it like explodes in your face, and you can never put it together again. No, we're saying that you shouldn't think of your, m your mechanical key systems as a single point of resistance. They're not going to provide you this ironclad -like security like no one could ever take it apart and just measure the pins. Sure, they fucking can. Well, yeah, but also yeah. there's implementational issues yeah. here, right? So if you're familiar with the Knoxbox type of system, the Knoxbox system is implemented a little bit better because you can't just buy the cam lock and take it apart, right? The right. fire department has to specifically authorize you to purchase and possess the cylinder itself. But that doesn't mean that the firefighters don't just lose these things in the hundreds. <laughs> Like, really? Come on. That was over like two or three years, too. It wasn't, yeah. I mean, this, we're talking like one a day. Now, this is all, again, this is 
fire service operation. This is one of the most powerful modes. It's actually not as hard as you think to get the keys. No, we won't just give them to you. Maybe you'll like hacksaw my laptop and get the biddings that I redacted or something out of the back slides. But there's one more mode. Remember, there's hoistway access. What can you do in the hoistway? The answer is everything. What if you have a building that you, like, you know the fire key in the lobby that we used? Like, if you're not in the lobby, what if you want to move around the building? Well, if you seize control of the elevator and you get on the car top, and I don't mean you, because you shouldn't, you could do this. On the lower right, you see where we are. The, lower, the upper right is where we want to be. This is an elevator that is driving itself down the hoistway because we've kind of sent some calls down that way. If we want to, we can seize the car in a way that's completely out of standard. You're not supposed to do it. I've learned from Howard there's three ways to do things. There's the right way, the wrong way, and the elevator person way, which is like the wrong way faster, basically. Yes. So here we are. Okay, there's the car top. All right, we're on, in, we're, we're on a mode. We're not going to really talk about any of this right now, but if we take control of this elevator and we get onto the car top, my mom hated this video. She yelled at, she like almost smacked me when she saw me. She's like, what, what, what are they doing? You shouldn't be there. Those two guys know what they're doing. You're an idiot. <laughs> so once you're in the hoist okay. way, though, Oh you can God. drive this car anywhere. Going up, going up. It literally doesn't matter if this is like almost a fed facility, which this one wasn't. But in the hoist way, your risk of life is so great that you have utter and absolute control. You can drive any direction. You can go to any other floor. What kind of security do you think the hoist way doors have on the inside? There we are. Legs are on three. Stop. Yeah, zero and all. There we are. Thank you. Good night. And you can just send it down. So how do we do that? Well, you've seen that little hole, right? Right. Real quick disclaimer, there was another video that we didn't show you where we actually are completely out of control and almost crash into the overhead. Yeah, so you hear us shouting down, down, down in the black and like jumping down on the grease of the elevator car top. Yes, sometimes things can be unpredictable even when you have experience. Things are sometimes out of your control. So yeah, so if you see that hole in the door, that's called an escutcheon hole. And that is the hole through which elevator personnel will slip a key that will usually flip a little flag that releases the door interlock. The door interlock does two things. It keeps the hoistway doors mechanically closed, and it also electrically signals to the controller that the doors are closed. So when an elevator mechanic sticks his key in, turns it, it does two things. It unlocks the door, and it sends a signal to the elevator controller that the doors are open, stop the cab. So with that being said, there's a million different kinds of keys, but there's basically a key for every door at the end of the day. And even at places like this, where you see sometimes it doesn't have the hole, there are often ways of interacting with the interlock that you might not expect. I know how uber this talk is. I really do. Unfortunately, we're trying to set up for final ceremonies, and this track has to end. Now, I have a problem with usually we shot the speakers. You know, that's nice for them. But we have little tricks up our sleeves to lure the speakers off stage. So I brought with me some bait. Come on. Come on, speakers. No. Nope. Come here. Come on. I'm literally not going because it is not the top of the hour yet. We have seven minutes, and we're going to use all seven minutes. The mask has spoken. So really fast. Do you know people used to stash drugs in hoistways because they could pop that escutcheon hole? They made a lock for it. The lock was interesting. It would like plug up the hole. The lock had a problem in the way it was assembled. The lock screwed together. So if the lock screws together and you can just unscrew the collar, you don't actually need the real key to open up the escutcheon lock. What you can do is say, all right, that's the speedy key. That's, that's the fast key. If you don't have that key, well, what if you had any other possible key ever? Yeah, put a little torque on that, push it a little harder. Oh my, what happened there? Yeah, just unscrew the escutcheon lock. Pull it apart, whatever, fine. Come talk to us later. So, we're going to skip a few slides. We're going to show you some others. In the end, there are some, some really common guidance we can give you, right? 
Yeah. First thing, if you have an emergency phone in the elevator that's answered by your security desk, test it. This is a case where a guy got stuck in an elevator for 48 hours or, or over 48 hours because the phone and the alarm bell didn't work. It ended up in being a, a lawsuit and a settlement, whatever. Test your alarm bell. Make sure the alarm bell works too. And for Can't the be, love yeah. of people Christ, out of the freaking hoistway. The hoistway should never be accessible. No one should get in there and ride the fucking counterweight. <laughs> if anybody recognizes this photo, I'll buy you a drink at the bar. Yeah. Your, your motor rooms, the, the code says the door should be self-closing, self-locking. Correct. This is A, not self-closing or self-locking, and B is being operated by a freaking mall security guard who shouldn't be in there because it's dangerous. Only elevator people should be in there because you know these guys are elevator guys, right? Yeah. Know who your elevator staff is. They are not your maintenance crew. They are very nice, sir. Know who your people are that provide your maintenance versus consulting. Know who your people are and know what they're doing. If you have bullshit jobs, if you have paperwork that's not being pulled out, if you have collusion, if you have inspections that don't make any sense, like, what is this? There are yeah. test tags. It's a permanently affixed tag that after the test every year, every five years is performed, they fill it out, they indicate that the elevator passed, hopefully, and then it's left there so that if somebody ever has to come in and take a look, it says when the test was done and what the result was. So in this, this case, was performed by Otis let us know that Otis performed the test. Because that makes sense. You know, unless the guy's name was Otis, right? Right. Elevator tests are important. Here's a final readiness test. Yeah, and the, the client didn't, they thought, no, it's fine, right? Well, to be fair, the elevator mechanic was like, there's no way this is going to work. And he actually made his supervisor come down. He was the one recording. And he was like, all right, you know what? You want to run this test? You run the test. I'll record it. I'll record it, it okay? with my iPhone. <laughs> So yeah, follow all of your building procedures. How many times we've coasted in on like, oh, I'm the elevator guy, I belong here. Clearly, I have a shirt that I bought, which you, you can't anymore, right? Yes, you can no longer buy the uniforms we're wearing right now. Pretty much thanks I to us. I think Tissen saw our talk earlier. Like, I believe they did. So what do, you, what do you do now? If your elevators are maybe part of your security model and you're like, oh my God, what if people are going to attack the elevators because they're not actually doing what we think? There is a difference between your parts, oil, and grease tech and a security consultant. There are people who do this, not like a lot of them. He's kind of one of the only ones we've ever met. But your elevator controller can actually do monitoring without installing a fucking Windows box in the motor room. Your elevator controller can open or close contacts if it gets flipped onto independent mode or hoistway you know, inspection mode or fire mode. You can be logging this with your access control system, with your alarm system. There are add-on boards. There are extra modules you can use to make your system better. We're going to wrap it up in one minute with some final tips. They're going to be very useful if you're a jackass and get stuck. First tip, don't panic. You're not going to run out of air. That's something I've actually heard. There is a fan, there's ventilation, and just in general there's oxygen. So just relax. The second thing is if you're on a red team job, you might not want to hit the emergency phone. That's probably your best bet as a civilian if you just happen to be stuck. But if the main lights in the cab are off, the power's out. There's nothing you can do. Call for help. If the cab lights are still on, you might have a few options. So let's just run through the script that the people on the other end of the phone are going to run through anyway. They're going to tell you to hit door open. Would you believe that happens all the time? Someone's just sitting there, the cab is parked, and they just don't think to hit door open. They're hitting the, you know, the emergency phone. Yeah. They might tell you hit door close and then hit door open. This sometimes, when the door operator hasn't fully closed the doors, allows the doors to fully close, signaling to the elevator that it's safe to run. Another option would be make sure that you just can register a call to another floor. If you're sitting there staring at it, it's stuck and all the buttons are lit up, you're stuck. But maybe you're just stuck at a floor that you don't have access to. Yeah, badge in, etc. Right. If you have a badge, absolutely make sure you're badged in before you're placing these calls. Maybe you're an authorized user and you have key switches. You authorized. Can, Maybe you know me. <laughs> you yeah. emailed me and bought some keys. Right? You, you can try the key switches as well. I've been stuck in elevators where that didn't matter. And of course, 
The last thing is, keep in mind, the number one cause of entrapments is that the doors have opened somewhere. It might not be where you are, but it might be where you are. So I very hesitantly say this, but you can kind of troubleshoot the doors in a safe way. Don't try to pry the doors. Don't stick your hand in the gap between the doors. Don't stick anything in the gap between the doors. Just very gently put your palm on the door. See if it's jiggling at all. Try to close them with the flat part of your hand somewhere square on the door. Do not stick it any, in any yeah. of those uh, you know, recessions or spaces there. And if all else fails, call for help. I'll help you. Yeah. Never, ever, ever try to leave through the top hatch. It doesn't lead you anywhere, and it'll fuck other shit up. If the hatch is open, the elevator won't run. Never, ever exit a misleveled car. If you have to jump, it's too far. If you were a dope and you did something weird and you got stuck, stay in the elevator. It's the safest place to be. The elevator wants to keep you alive. We wanted to keep you alive. We hope you learned something today. Thank you for letting us talk at DEF CON.